Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session on Sophocles Antigone. This is in fact my fourth lecture on Sophocles Antigone. In the very first session I introduced to you the Greek tragedian Sophocles and his masterpiece Antigone. I divided the play Antigone into four parts and in the earlier two videos we together read the first two parts. We have two more sessions on this particular play of which the first will be taken today. We will have one final session later. So let me just give you a brief idea regarding whatever that happened in the first two parts. We met some of the important characters in the play like Antigone and Ismini, who are the daughters of Oedipus, the only children of Oedipus who are alive. We met Creon, who is at present the king of Thebes. As you are aware of, in the battle between Argos and Thebes, both Polynices and Eteocles died. They killed each other. So, Creon being their next of kin assumed power. He talks about his policies and he makes it clear that he has plans to give honorable rights, due honorable rights to Eteocles who fought for Thebes and he has no plans to give any sort of after burial honors or after death honors to Polynices who fought against Thebes. Ismini and Antigone are both sad about this particular proclamation that was made by King Creon. Antigone decides to go against it. She decides to disobey King Creon. But Ismini is helpless, she is weak, so she uh, you know, abstains from it. And then we get the news from the sentry that Someone has buried the corpse, but they could not identify who it was or see who had done it. So, Creon says, you are supposed to find out the person or you will have to suffer for it. You will be tormented for it. And later on, we find that Antigone is brought before King Creon and the sentry says that she is the perpetrator. She is the one who disobeyed you. She is the one who buried the body. And then we see a conversation happening between Antigone and Creo. We have such you know, short exchanges between two characters which can be termed as stichomythia, which is a technique that you employ when uh, you have a dialogue, a conversation, short dialogue, dialogue exchanges happening between two characters. So it's called stichomythia. So you have such exchanges between Antigone and Ismini at the very outset. Then you have such exchanges between <clears throat> Creon and Antigone. We also see a slight uh, exchange there between Antigone and Ismini when they are both brought before uh, King Creon. So finally, King Creon decides to lock up both the women, both Antigone and Ismini. And perhaps Antigone might be sent to her death. So it is that particular point that we stopped in the previous session. Let's continue reading the play. Chorus Happy are they who know not the taste of evil. From a house that heaven hath shaken, the curse departs not. The curse that the chorus talks about here is the curse that befell this family when Oedipus killed his father and married his own mother. Like the restless surge of the sea when the dark storm drives, the black sand hurled from the deeps and the Thracian gales boom down on the echoing shore. The Thracian gales means you know, strong wind from Thrace. Thrace was an ancient uh, country which was colonized by Greeks. So as usual, I'll read the Stasimen. Stasimen, let me say again, is the song sung by Chorus. So I'll read the Stasimen and then I will elaborate on it. 
In life and in death is the house of Labdacus stricken. Labdacus is the grandson of Cadmus and Cadmus is the founder of Thebes. So please have these lineages in your mind. Cadmus is the founder of Thebes city and his grandson is Labdacus. Labdacus is also the father of Laius. And Laius is the father of Oedipus. So that is how the lineage comes down. So in life and in death is the house of Lebdacus stricken. Generation to generation with no atonement. Atonement means, you know, uh, atone for your sin. As we say, Paschata Bhikya in Malayalam. So no atonement. It is scourged by the wrath of God. Scourged here uh, means punished severely. And they are being punished severely just because of the sin that was committed by Oedipus. It is caused by the wrath of a god. Wrath means anger. And now for the dead does sake is the light of promise. The tree's last root crushed out by pride of heart and the sin of presumptuous tongue. So we have a reference being made to Antigone here. For what presumption of man can match thy power, O Zeus, that art not subject to that art not subject to sleep or time or age, living forever in bright Olympus. So it's believed that the gods in Greek mythology, they reside at Mount Olympus. So here uh, the chorus talks about the ultimate position and power of uh, Zeus, who is regarded as the god of all the gods and goddesses in Greek mythology. Tomorrow and for all time to come, as in the past, this law is immutable. Immutable means something which is constant and unchanging. For mortals, greatly to live is greatly to suffer. So a bit of philosophy, a tinge of philosophy that you get from these lines as well. For mortals, for us human beings, greatly to live is greatly to suffer. To live means to suffer, to survive or to suffer the pangs of some sort of misery. Roving ambition helps many a man to good and many it falsely lures to light desires, till failure trips them unawares, and they fall on the fire that consumes them. Well was it said, evil seems good to him who is doomed to suffer, and short is the time before that suffering comes. But here comes Haman. Haman, you might remember, he is the son of Creon. Here comes Haman, your youngest son. Does he speak to does he come to speak his sorrow for the doom of his promised bride? And who is the promised bride? Antigone. It was decided that Haman will marry Antigone. So is Haman coming to speak of his sorrow regarding his doomed promised bride? The loss of his marriage hopes. So this is what this is where the stasimon ends. So let me elaborate a bit on this particular stasimon. So uh, this is actually a song of woe, a song that you know, shares the grief, the grief related to the curse that has afflicted all the family members of the Labdacus family. So as I said earlier, Labdacus' is father uh, was Laius' father and Laius was Oedipus' father. So this particular curse has befallen all the members of Labdacus' family and that is why Etiogles and Polynices lost their lives. Uh, Ismini and Antigone are also suffering. So the chorus says, the body, the members, the, the, the Theban elders, they say that they interpret the context as this is because of the sin that was committed by Oedipus that all the members of the Laptacus family are suffering. And the chorus also say that, you know, uh, those who have not tasted evil are really happy. And when tragedy befalls a family, it comes not in single but in battalions. That is something which we experience as well. When something happens, or when something comes, when a tragedy comes, it comes in battalions, it comes, it comes in groups. Deeper and darker tragedies follow in the manner of storms. So we have a, you know, Grecian tales, we have uh, Thracian gales, sorry, Thracian gales. Uh, we have an expression like that in the play. Uh, the chorus also observes that the gods have been ruthless in destroying the descendants of Labdacus family. And then the chorus, you know, they pray to Zeus, who is regarded as the highest of all the Greek gods. They realize that man is powerless in the face of Zeus' might. And that Zeus is also an immutable 
figure as well as Greek mythology or their belief is concerned. So that is the gist of the statement that we just read. And at the end of the statement, the chorus uh, say that we have Haman on the stage. And Haman is Creon's son. So in the Haman, we have Haman on the stage. And Creon says, Son, you have heard, I think, our final judgment on your late betrothed. No angry words, I hope. Still friends, in spite of everything, my son. So this is what Creon expects, that Haman doesn't argue against the decision that was made by him. And these are carefully hidden in his words. Or this particular agenda is carefully hidden in his words. So no angry words, I hope. Still friends. So he uses such expressions to understand Haman's uh, mental state. Haman. I am your son, sir. By your wise decisions, my life is ruled, and them I shall always obey. I cannot value any marriage tie above your own good riddance. So from the initial conversation between Haman and um, Creon, we understand that uh, Haman sort of supports his father's decision. But is it really his opinion? That is what we need to find out. Let's read ahead and find it out. Creon rightly said, Your father's will should have your heart's first place. Only for this do fathers pray for sons. Obedient, loyal, ready to strike down their father's foes, foes means enemies, and love their father's friends. So Creon sort of you know, makes a statement on preference for sons over daughters. He says that this is why we pray for sons, so that we will have obedient, loyal and ready to strike down wards, ready to strike down children. No, sons who will strike down their father's enemies and will befriend their father's friends. To be the father of unprofitable sons is to be the father of sorrows, a laughing stock to all one's enemies. And this will be the consequence if you have an unprofitable son. You will be a father of sorrows and you will be a laughing stock to all of your enemies. Do not be fooled, my son, by lust and the wiles of a woman. Wiles means tricks. So do not be fooled by the tricks that Antigone might play on you. Father is warning his son. Do not be, you know, influenced by her tricks. Do not be influenced by the lust. You will have both cold comfort if your wife is a worthless one. So as far as Crayon is concerned, Antigone is a worthless one, is a worthless person. So you will bring, you will buy cold comfort if your wife is a worthless one. So your life won't be good if you marry, if you get yourself married to such a woman. No wound strikes deeper than love that is turned to hate. This girl is an enemy. Away with her and let her go and find a mate in Hades. Hades is the world of the dead. So Creon says, let her go and find her mate, find her partner, find her paramour in the world of the dead, in Hades. Once having caught her in a flagrant act, flagrant means something which is outrageously bad. Flagrant act the one and only traitor in our state, I cannot make myself a traitor too. So she must die. Well, may she pray to Zeus, the god of family love. How if I tolerate a traitor at home, shall I rule those abroad? Look at the kind of arguments that Creon puts forth. He calls her a worthless one. He asks her to go and find her partner in the world of death. He calls her a traitor and he also uh, says that you know, if I cannot tolerate a traitor at home, how will, we, how will I rule the one that is abroad? So how will I manage to rule this particular kingdom and perhaps the ones who are away from this kingdom uh, if I don't control my own family members? He that is a righteous master of his house will be a righteous statesman. So this is his policy. If you are a righteous person as far as your family is concerned, then you will be a righteous statesman as well. 
to transgress or twist the law to one's own pleasure, presume to order where one should obey is sinful and I will have none of it. So he doesn't want to bend rules for his own sake. That is Crayon's way of looking at things. He whom the state appoints must be obeyed to the smallest matter, be it right or wrong. So he is trying to, you know, thrust his particular view to his subjects as well. His view is that he must not bend rules for the sake of his family members. And he is trying to, you know, thrust that particular perception into others as well. And he that rules his household without a doubt will make the wisest king or for that matter the staunchest subject. Staunchest means someone who is firm and loyal. So if you are able to rule your household, then you will be able to rule your kingdom as well. You will be able to, you know, um, without a doubt, you will be able to be a good king or a wise king. He will be the man you can depend on the storm of war, on in the storm of war, the faithfulest comrade in the day of battle. There is no more deadly peril than disobedience. States are dis devoured by it, homes laid in ruins, armies defeated, victory turned to rout. So these are the consequences that you will have to face for disobedience. Now I have seen states being devoured by it, in state being dis states being dis destroyed by it. Homes laid in ruins, homes destroyed by disobedience, armies defeated and victory turned to rout. Rout means defeat. So all this happens happen because of disobedience. While simple obedience saves the lives of hundreds of honest folk. So this is what Creon wants of Antigone. He wants or he wanted Antigone to obey him. But unfortunately, she does not. And that is why she has to face her end. Therefore, I hold to the law and will never betray it. Least of all for a woman. So it's quite obvious that Crayon has a kind of, you know, uh, very low opinion about woman. Uh, he says that, you know, I will not bend the law. I will bend the law least for a woman. I will never do it for a woman. So that is the kind of place that Crayon had had in his or has in his heart with respect to woman. Better be beaten if need be by a man than let a woman get the better of us. So again, he reiterates his idea on woman. He would be he would prefer to be beaten by a man rather than to be. You know, uh, rather than a woman getting the better of them, which means a woman winning over them. So he would rather prefer to be beaten by a man by rather being won by a woman. Chorus. To me, as far as an old man can tell, it seems your majesty has spoken well. So after Crayon's speech, Chorus makes his comment about his speech that he has spoken well. But has he spoken the truth? That is what we need to find out. Now it's Haman who addresses his father. He says, Father, man's wisdom is the gift of heaven, the greatest gift of all. I neither am nor wish to be clever enough to prove you wrong, though all men might not think the same as you do. So at this point, Haman starts to digress from his earlier stand. Now, as I said earlier, now, at that particular point, we, you know, uh, understood or we um, realized that Haman was actually supporting his father. But here he says, though all men might not think the same as you do. So he tells his father that everyone may not think like you. And this indicates that he is gradually deviating from his earlier stand. Nevertheless, I have to be your watchdog. Watchdog means a guardian or a defender. To know what others say and what they do and what they find to praise and what to blame. Your frown is a sufficient silencer of any word that is not for your ears. So, uh, Haven perhaps repeats what Ismini, uh, Antigone had said earlier. Antigone had said that everyone is afraid of you and that is why they don't speak out their heart. Everyone believes that I have done what I have done is an honorable act. They don't convey it to you because they are afraid of you. And Haman tells the same thing to his father. Your frown is a sufficient silencer. 
your angry face you now it will silence everybody around you and it will silence or it will not let anyone speak out their heart or what they really want to speak out but i hear whispers spoken in the dark on every side i hear voices of pity for this poor girl doomed to the cruelest death and most unjust that ever woman suffered for an honorable action so through this particular statement hayman uh, gives out gives out the you know uh, his idea or his or the or the idea of the folks around him that uh, what antigone did was something which was very much honorable and also that you know uh, she is being condemned to the cruelest death and crayon has done something or uh, crayon has done injustice to antigone and why is it called injustice why is it is being described as something which is unjust or injustice because you know people think that what antigone did was an honorable action for an honorable action what is an honorable action burying a brother who was killed in battle rather than leave him naked for dogs to maul and carrion birds to peck at has she not rather earned a crown of gold such is the secret talk about the town so hayman puts uh, his thoughts or perhaps you know as he says the points of view of the general public uh, to his father and hayman says the people think that the your subjects think that what she has done is something which is honorable and that she is being condemned that she is being treat uh, treated with injustice that she is being sent to her, the most cruelest death that any woman has ever confronted father there is nothing i can prize above your happiness and well being what greater good can any son desire can any father desire more from his son therefore i say let not your first thought be your only thought so hayman wants his father crayon to rethink on his decision because his subjects do not think like him they believe that what she has done is honorable they believe that she has earned a crown of gold and therefore hayman requests his father to rethink his decision he says let not be let not your first thought be your only thought think if there cannot be some other way surely to think you are on the only wisdom and use the only word the only will betrays a shallow spirit an empty heart so please uh, don't think that your word is the final word that what you thought is is the only thought that that, that the king the subject in his kingdom will have so please you know uh, rethink your decision it is no weakness for the wisest man to learn when he is wrong know when to yield yield means to you know uh, something who, someone who is you know um willing to change or willing to admit his mistake so uh, it's only a wise man who can learn from his mistakes only a wise man can accept or admit his mistakes so on the margin of a flooded river trees bending to the torrent live unbroken while those that strain against it are snapped off he even gives an imagery he even gives us an analogy to explain uh, his to explain to crayon his argument he says the trees on on the banks of a flooded river you no know, it will bend in the torrent it will bend in the torrent so that it can survive and the trees that strain against the flood against the current are snapped off so you don't have to you know bend against the uh, current against the torrent you actually have to bend yourself a sailor has to tack and slack and sheets before the gale or find himself capsized so you have a second analogy there the first analogy was between or was made with the trees on the banks of a flooded river and then you have a sailor uh, the imagery of a sailor the analogy of a sailor uh hayman says a sailor has to tack and slacken sheets slacken means to loosen loosen his mast or loosen his sheets before the gale gale means a strong wind so he has to put down loosen the mast the mast sheets or else he will find himself capsized he will definitely drown in the sea or water so father pause and put aside your anger i think for what my young opinions worth 
that good as it is to have infallible wisdom. Infallible wisdom means a wisdom that cannot fail you. Incapable of failure. That is what the adjective infallible means. That good as it is to have infallible wisdom, since this is rarely found, the next best thing is to be willing to listen to wise advice. So this is what Haman wants his father Creon to do. He wants to rethink his decision. He gives various analogies to prove that it only a wise man can uh, you know, admit his mistakes and learn from his less, uh, mistakes. And he finally, he winds up his long speech by saying that you, know, you have to seek wise advice. You have to take advice from others. Let's see what Chorus uh, say about this particular speech made by Haman. Chorus says, there is something to be said, my lord, for his point of view and for yours as well. There is much to be said on both sides. So the chorus takes a neutral standpoint here. They say that you know, there is something, something to be said about Haman's speech and also about uh, Creon's speech. Both have you know, uh, justice in their sides. Creon, indeed. Am I to take lessons at my time of life from a fellow of his age? Creon makes his point clear. He is not going to take any uh, advice from his son. He says, am I to take lessons at my time of life? Which means he is an elder man. He is an older man. So, he, is he to take advice from his son who is much younger than him? Haman, no lesson you need be shamed or ashamed of. It isn't a question of age, but of right and wrong. So this is what needs to be you know, taken into account. Not the age, not our ages, but what I am trying to convey to you. Crayon, would you call it right to admire an act of disobedience? Haman, not if the act were also dishonorable. Dishonorable means lacking honor. So what Crayon did was something which was very dishonorable, something that lacked honorable. He tried to, he decided to, you know, kill someone who did an honorable act. So we have again the stichomythia, the technique employed here again, the conversation, the short dialogue exchange between Haman and Creon. Haman, not if the act were also dishonorable. Creon, and was not this woman's action dishonorable? Haman, the people of think, Thebes think not. Creon, the people of Thebes since when do I take my orders from the people of Thebes? So this kind of indicates the arrogant attitude of Creon. The arrogant, superior, authoritative kind of status that he has grown into. Earlier he was willing to take advice. He said to the chorus that you know, I will be doomed if I don't take advice from my counselors, from the subjects. And as of now he says, the people of Thebes. When do I take my orders from the people of Thebes? Which shows that he is arrogant enough not to take advice, counsel from the people of Thebes. Haman says, isn't that rather a childish, childish thing to say? Creon, no, I am king and responsible only to myself. Haman, a one-man state? What sort of a state is that? Creon, why? Does not every state belong to its ruler? Haman, you would be an excellent king on a desert island. So he's trying to mock at the authoritative stature, stature that uh, Creon has you know, assumed as of now. You would make an excellent king if you were on a deserted island. Creon, of course, if you are on the woman's side, Haman, no, no, unless you are the woman. It is you I am fighting for. Creon, what? Villain, when every word you speak is against me, Haman, only because I know you are wrong. Creon, wrong to respect my own authority. Haman, what sort of a respect tramples on that on all that is holy? Tramples means to stamp heavily upon something. So what sort of a respect trambles on all that is holy? You are trampling on everything that can be termed as holy. Crayon, despicable coward. So look at the expression that he uses to describe or to address his own son, Haman. Despicable coward. Despicable, despicable means someone who deserves hatred and you know, contempt. Despicable coward. 
no more will than a woman so you don't have will more than a woman again you know it indirectly shows the kind of stature or kind of perception that he has regarding crayon has regarding woman or women Haman, i have nothing to be ashamed of crayon yet you plead her cause Haman, no yours and mine and that of the gods of the dead crayon you will never marry her this side of death Amen. Then if she dies, she does not die alone. Crayon, is that a threat, you impudent? Impudent means someone who, you know, shows no respect to others uh, or to another person. So is that a threat, you impudent? Amen. Is it a threat to try to argue against wrong-headedness? Crayon, you will learn what wrong-headedness is, my friend, to your cost. Haman, or further, I could call you mad were you not my father. So at this point, Haman wants to call his father mad. But he doesn't do it because he is his father. Crayon, don't toady me, boy. Toady means to, you know, try to please someone for uh, uh, for his or her own advantage. So Crayon feels that he's trying to please him. Of Don't toady me, boy. Keep that for your lady, love. Haman, you mean to have the last word then? So Crayon, uh, Haman asks, is that your decision? Is that your final decision? Crayon, I do. And what is more, by all the gods in heaven, I will make you sorry for your impudence. Crayon calls to the people who are within. Bring out that she-devil and let her die now with her bridegroom by to see it done. So Crayon is so angry that he wants to finish off Antigone then and there before uh, Haman itself. He wants Haman to see the cruel you know, uh, death that Crayon is going to offer to Antigone. And therefore he asks others inside to bring Antigone outside. But Haman says, that sight I will never see. Nor from this hour shall you see me again. Let those that will be witness of your wickedness and folly. So let people who are willing to see it, let them see it. I'm not going to stay back to see that particular sight. And you will never see me again. And saying this, Haman exits. Chorus says, He is gone, my lord, in a very passionate haste. And who shall say that a young, what a young man's wrath may do? Crayon, let him go. Let him do. Let him rage as never man raged. He shall not save those women from their doom. So Crayon is too blinded now. All he want to uh, do is to, to punish the person who has disobeyed him. So he has been a king only for a while, but he has, you know, a kind of uh, indicated us you know, what sort of a king he is. He is not going to let people disobey him. That is why he wants to punish uh, Antigone. Chorus. You mean then, sire, to put them both to death? So are you planning to kill both Antigone and Ismini? Crayon, no, not the one whose hand was innocent. Chorus, and to what death do you condemn the other? So Crayon says, no, I'm not going to kill Ismini, but the other person, the other one, who is Antigone. And Chorus asks, and how are you planning to kill her? Crayon, I will have her taken to a desert place where no man ever walked, and there walled up inside a cave alive with food enough to acquit ourselves of the blood guiltiness that ours would be upon our commonwealth, there she may pray to death the God she loves and ask release from death, or learn at last what hope there is for those who worship death. So this is the kind of death that uh, Crayon is offering to Antigone. He says that she will be locked up in a cave, in a desert, where no man has walked. She would be given some meager amount of food so that, you know, the death or the blood of her death might will not fall upon um, Crayon's family. And there she can lie there and pray to the God of death. And she can ask her to relieve him from, relieve her from death. So that is the kind of uh, death that uh, Crayon has planned for Antigone. And saying this, Crayon exits. Now we have the next stasimon here. Chorus says, sings, Where is the equal of love? Where is the battle he cannot win? 
the power he cannot outmatch. In the farthest corners of earth, in the midst of the sea, he is there. He is here in the gloom of a fair face, lying in wait, and the grip of his madness spares not good, nor or nor not God or man. Marring the righteous man, driving his soul into mazes of sin and strife, dividing a house for the light that burns in the eyes of a bride of desire, is a fire that consumes. At the side of the great gods, Aphrodite, immortal, works her will upon all. So this is the next song that is sung by the chorus. It's As I said earlier, this is also called a stasimen. Let's uh, try to understand what this particular stasimen means. This is a stir, third stasimen. So uh, this particular stasimen is actually a, an ode in the praise of love. And love is described as a warrior who is never conquered in fight. So love is described or personified as a warrior who is never conquered. And love, it wrecks havoc on rich and the famous alike. It wrecks havoc. It destroys rich and famous. So it is personified as a human being or even as a lover who keeps watch the whole night long in order to make advances towards young maiden. So you have such figurative expressions over here being uh, you know, given to us by the chorus. And chorus says, nobody can avoid the pains and thrills of love. No, human beings as well as gods are overcome by love and they experience its frenzy, the mad state that you know it takes people to. And both gods and human beings alike, they experience the state of frenzy. And chorus also sees love as a distraction which draws righteous men to their destruction, to their doom. And we also have a reference to Aphrodite who is the goddess of love. And chorus says that she rules over man's, men's heart hearts and sways them so that they are led to disaster. So this choral ode, this stasmen, which is a third stasmen, uh, it also is, a, is an ode which comments on the action of the previous scene, whatever that happened earlier in the previous two episodes, and also points out that, you know, you must learn a lesson from the, um, from the kind of love that you just experienced. So it ends on a note of counsel, on a note of advice. The doors are opened and Antigone enters guarded. Chorus says, But here is a sight beyond all bearing, at which my eyes cannot but weep. Antigone forth faring, Antigone walking towards, to her bridal bower of endless sleep. So here we have the sight of Antigone, who is being you know, led towards her death, towards her destruction. Antigone. You see me, countrymen, on my last journey, taking my last leave of the light of day, going to my rest where death shall take me alive across this silent river. The river referred to here is uh, the Hades River. In Greek mythology, once you cross this river, you reach the uh, kingdom of uh, Hades. You reach the place called Hades, which is the world of the dead. No wedding day, no marriage music. Death will be all my bridal dower. So death is my dowry. Death is the gift that I get. So I walk towards my destruction. Chorus. But glory and praise go with you, lady, to your resting place. You go with your beauty unmarred by the hand of consuming sickness, untouched by the sword, living and free as none other that ever died before you. So it's like Horus is trying to you know, point out all the good things that is that she is taking along with her you know, while she is moving ahead to her death. She says, glory, the chorus say, glory and praise, praise go with you. You take your beauty that is unmarred, un, which, which is not destroyed, untouched by the hand of consuming sickness, uh, untouched by the sword, you were, you lived freely and you take a death like none ever died before, like none ever took before. Antigone says, the daughter of Tantalus, a Phrygian maid. So the reference is to Niobe, uh, 
who is the daughter of king of Sipilus, which is an ancient state of uh, state in uh, Greece, Athens. See, uh, Antigone says, Antigone talks about Niobe, whose children were actually killed by the gods to punish her for excessive pride. And excessive pride, as in Greek uh, terminology is, or Greek uh, tragedy is hubris. So, gods, they decided to kill Niobe's children because she had around six children and she was she took pride in that fact and she you know, started mocking others uh, who had only less number of children. So, she had this tragic flaw called hubris and gods decided to punish her and they punished her by slaying, by killing all, all her children. And she was you know, very sad and because of this excessive grief, it is said that she turned herself into a rock and tears, you know, continued to flow from that rock. So this is the story that is being alluded to here by uh, Antigone, the daughter of Tantalus, who was the king of Sipilus. The daughter of Tantalus, a Phrygian maid, was doomed to a piteous death on the rock of Sipilus, which embraced and imprisoned her merciless as the ivy, rain and snow beat down upon her, mingled with her tears, and she, as she wasted and died. Such was her story, and such is the sleep that I shall go to. So such is the kind of destruction, death that I also am destined to. Chorus. She was a goddess of immortal birth, and we are mortals. The greater the glory to share the fate of a god-born maiden, a living death, but a name undying. Antigone. So, chorus, what they do is they try to equate, you know, um, Niobe or a goddess with uh, Antigone. So, Antigone says, mockery, mockery. Are you trying to make fun of me? Is this a mockery? Are you trying to, you know, make a fool out of me? By the gods of our fathers, must you make me a laughing stock while I yet live? O lordly sons of my city, O thieves, your valleys of rivers, your chariots and horses, no friend to weep at my banishment to a rock-hewn chamber of endless durance. Durance means imprisonment. In a strange cold tomb, alone to linger, lost between life and death forever. So is this the kind of punishment that I receive for doing an honorable action, for fulfilling my duty to my brother? So he asks, so she asked Thebes, she asked the city of Thebes, is this a kind of death that you are giving me? You are going to, you know, imprison me in a rock-hewn chamber, in a rock-shaped chamber? Are you going to let me, you know, go astray between life and death forever? Chorus. Uh, it's Chorus, you know, represents the city of Thebes, the people of Thebes and that is why we have this interaction going on between or that is why Antigone you know sort of addresses the Thebes city itself you know, while addressing the chorus. Chorus says my child you have gone your way to the out outermost limit of daring and have stumbled against law enthroned. This is the expiation. Expiation means compensation, compensation for a wrongdoing for a sin that you did. This is the expiation you must make for the sin of your father. So again, we are reminded of the sin that was committed by Oedipus. And this is the expiation, the compensation that you have to do for your sin of the for, for the sin of your father. Antigone. My father, the thought that sears my soul, the unending burden of the house of Lebdacus. Sears means you know burns. My father, the thought that burns my soul, the unending burden of the house of Lepdacus, monstrous marriage of mother and son. So again, we are reminded of the events of the past, the monstrous marriage between the mother and son. It's a taboo actually, something which is you know, prevented, something which is restricted by the society. It's a taboo. So, the, so Antigone calls it a monstrous thing to do. Monstrous marriage of mother and son. My father... My parents, oh hideous shame. Hideous means something which is very offensive. Oh hideous shame, whom now I follow, unwed, curse ridden, doomed to his death by the ill starred marriage that marred my brother's life. So again, the family, the members of the family, the chorus, they all repeat, you know, they all reiterate the you know sin that was committed by uh, 
uh, Oedipus and they reiterate the fact that it is this particular sin committed by Oedipus that has befallen or that has brought about the plague or destruction to Labdacus family members. That is what killed Polynesus and Eteocles and that is what is probably leading Antigone to her destruction. Chorus An act of homage is good in itself, my daughter, but authority cannot afford to connive at disobedience. You are the victim of your own self-will. So Chorus says, it was an act of homage. What you did for your brother was an act of homage and that is something which is very good. But the authority cannot afford to connive at disobedience. The authority cannot promote illegal things. It has to punish someone you know, when they do illegal stuff. Antigone. And must go the way that lies before me. No funeral hymn. No marriage music. No sun from this day forth. No light. No friend to weep at my departing. So this is the kind of you know, farewell that Antigone gets. Farewell unto death. She has no funeral hymn. She, ha she is not married. And she is not going to see any light from this day forth. And also no friend to weep at her departing. This is where Crayon enters. Crayon. Weeping and wailing at the door of death. There would be no end of it if it had force to buy death off. Away with her at once and close her up in her rock watered tomb. Leave her and let her die, if die she must, or live within her dungeon. Dungeon means a dark cell, the rock-hewn chamber. Though on earth her life is ended from this day, her blood will not be on our hands. So he is not going to murder her, let her live or die in the rock chamber. He is going to provide her with little amount of food. Let her survive or let her meet with her hand. He doesn't want her blood to fall on his family. And Crayon says this and you know Antigone is going to be led her away to her cell. Antigone says, So to my grave, my bridal bower, my last everlasting prison, I go to join those many of my kinsmen who dwell in the mansions of Persephone. Persephone is the queen of the underworld. So she is walking towards the underworld. Figuratively and literally it means she is walking towards her death. Last and unhappiest before my time. Yet I believe my father will be there to welcome me. My mother greet me gladly. And you, my brother, gladly see me come. Each one of you my hands have laid to rest, pouring the due libations on your graves. Libation means that which is due for the dead person. It was by this service to your dead body, Polynesus, I earned the punishment which now I suffer, though all good people know it was for your honor. Oh, but I would not have done the forbidden thing for any husband or for any son. So Antigone says, I did it for you, my brother, and it's for you. It's because I did this for you that I am suffering this. And she also says, I would not have done this thing for any husband or for any son. What is the reason for that? She says, for why? I could have had another husband and by him another son if one were lost. So I could have had another husband and through him and other children. But father and mother lost. Where would I get another brother? So that is how precious Polynesus is for Antigone. For thus preferring you, my brother, Crayon condemns me and hails me away. Never a bride, never a mother, unfriended, condemned alive to solitary death. <clears throat> so it's to, it's to Polynesus that she says all these things. Probably to Polynesus in, who is residing now in Hades, the world of uh, the dead. He says, she says, it's because I offered you your burial rites that I am to, you know, uh, walk towards my death. Uh, never a bride, never a mother and unfriended. What law of heaven have I transgressed? Again, this is what she wants to know. What law of heaven has she transgressed? She is against the law that is made by man, made by crayon. But she wants to know what law of heaven has she transgressed, violated. What God can save me now? What help or hope have I in whom devotion is deemed sacrilege? 
If this is God's will, I shall learn my lesson in death. But if my enemies are wrong, I wish them no worse punishment than mine. So if this is what God's want, I am ready to face it. But if what the men, what Crayon is doing to me is wrong, then I wish them no worse punishment than mine. Then I wish them death. Chorus. Still the same tempest in the heart. Tempest means a violent wind. <clears throat> Still the same tempest in the heart torments her soul with angry gusts. Crayon. The more cause then have they that guard her to hasten their work or they to suffer. So hasten the work, prepare the rock chamber, prepare the cave and let her be led to her cave of death. Or else the people who are prepared in this cave will too suffer. Chorus. Alas, that word had the sound of death. Crayon. Indeed, there is no more to hope for. Antigone. Gods of our fathers, my city, my home, rulers of Thebes, time stays no longer. Last daughter of your royal house, go I, his prisoner, because I honor those things to which honor truly belongs. And Antigone is led away. So as of now, Antigone is led to her rock hewn chamber where will she spend where she will spend the rest of her time. So that is where we will stop for the day. Thank you so much.